Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Raymond Yeo. And I'm Bo Leung. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. High Court says Exco acted unlawfully in refusing HKTV a free-to-air licence. Justice Chief Rimsky Yoon gets in war of words during radio debate. And Regina Ip apologises for offending Filipinos in controversial article. Hong Kong Television Network has won a judicial review over its unsuccessful bid to apply for a free-to-air licence in 2013. In handing down the judgment, the High Court, High Court Judge Thomas R. ruled that the Executive Council violated the policy that there should not be a cap on the number of broadcasting licenses issued. Exco claimed it had to adopt a gradual and orderly approach when it rejected HKTV a license while approving two other applications, although HKTV was the first to submit its bid in 2009. The decision triggered massive protests outside government headquarters at the time. HKTV chairman Ricky Wong welcomed the judgment and believes it shows that the rule of law is still intact. He urged Exco to grant the station a license as soon as possible. Justice Chief Rimsky Yoon took to the airwaves this morning to promote the government's final political reform package, but got into a war of words with a pan Democrat lawmaker. He also dismissed rumors that Beijing is planning to draft a set of rules over the future chief executive appointments for Hong Kong and Macau. Justice Chief Rimsky Yoon was on radio this morning to rally public support for the government's final political reform package unveiled earlier this week. Along with Chief Executive Lian Chenying and other top ministers, Yun was mobbed by protesters as they appeared at a promotional event in Meifu on Wednesday. He said the rowdy experience would not deter them from doing more community visits. I don't think we should, uh, simply because of this ordinary conduct, stop uh, the kind of activities that we have planned because I think it's important that we should engage uh, people in the community and simply because a minority of people uh, choose to resort to such, kind of, to such kind of order, that should not be a reason to stop it. He quoted polls in saying that 50 to 60 percent of the public are in favour of the proposal, but only 30 to 35 percent opposing it. If we are to, uh, to proceed on a democratic basis, should we not take into account uh, the view of the majority? Should we not discharge our responsibility to this group of people who say we want to have universal suffrage in the year 2017? Therefore, giving up is not an option for the government, and it would not be in the best interest of Hong Kong to do so. But Civic Party lawmaker Dennis Kwok insisted many polls have suggested otherwise. For this kind of constitutional reform to happen, you really need a clear consensus within society, and you do not have that. And when you try to force a constitutional reform package through like this, without when there's no clear consensus, I believe you do more damage to the stability and prosperity of Hong Kong in the short to medium term. Kwok, who represents the legal sector and is one of the pan-Democrats who have vowed to veto the package, said his constituents would not have allowed him to pass the highly restrictive model. The justice chief disagreed. Let's not forget, apart from mandate, that the ultimate duty of a member of LegCo is to consider the overall interest in Hong Kong. Let's move forward. Let's gain the experience into our own session. Secretary, well, if, if is, the Hong Kong people doesn't like the direction where you're taking them or where you're proposing, why do you want to force this on them? Tempest fled soon, and the pair got into a heated argument. In of Hong Kong, in, I the, am in fact, that, in the Secretary. email, in the email, I don't think you can deny that. In fact, there is at least one. Speaking email to reporters after the program, Yun said he has never heard of plans by the central government to draft a set of rules on the appointment of the chief executive. The idea was reported by local newspaper Ming Pao today, which aims to standardize the appointment mechanism of the leaders of Hong Kong and Macau. Currently, the power to appoint the chief executive already lies in the hands of the state council. Former chief secretary Anson Chan questioned Beijing's motive and believes it is unnecessary. But Basic Law Committee Deputy Chief Elsie Leung said the central government has the authority to oversee the procedure, although she has also not heard of the plan. 
Executive Counselor Regina Ip has apologized to anyone offended by her controversial remarks about Filipino maids. The lawmaker insists her newspaper article about domestic helpers was misinterpreted and she denied allegations of being sexist or racist. A week after causing outrage for saying she received complaints during her time in office about Filipino domestic helpers seducing their expatriate bosses, Regina Ip says she's sorry. The article was published last Friday in the Chinese language newspaper Ming Pao. The piece was also published on her website and social media page, but were later removed. In a written statement released today, Ip said she wants to tender her sincere apologies to all those who were offended by her article. I treasure my friendship with the Filipino community, she went on to say. The executive council member insisted she did not make sexist or racist accusations and said her article was misinterpreted. The new People's Party chairwoman said the misunderstanding caused is deeply regretted. It pointed out that the purpose of the article was to question whether there is widespread exploitation of Filipino maids in Hong Kong. Ip also said it was a pity that she couldn't meet a domestic helpers group and their supporters, who held a demonstration outside her office yesterday demanding an apology, because she was held up at a Legislative Council meeting. The lawmaker continued to say that she respects the hard work of Filipinos and their contribution to the Hong Kong community. A three-car accident happened near Olympic Station during rush hour this morning, injuring over 30 people. Nobody has been arrested for the incident yet, but police say somebody may be charged for speeding and tailgating. Dozens of people injured in the accident sat on the roadside as they waited for treatment. Most of them were passengers on a shuttle bus. The incident happened at around 8.30 this morning. A concrete mixing truck travelling along the West Kowloon Highway towards the Western Harbour Tunnel started slowing down. A shuttle bus travelling from Yunlong to Causeway Bay that was following the mixer also slowed down. But the driver from a dump truck behind the bus couldn't slow down in time and rammed into the shuttle bus and shunted it into the mixer. 16 male and 22 female passengers between 20 and 55 years old were injured in the accident. They were taken to Kuang Wa, Queen Elizabeth and Princess Margaret hospitals. According to police, two people suffered serious injuries, but most of the others were minor injuries on their heads, arms and legs. Police say the area is not an accident black spot. Police have cracked a large phone scam ring, arresting as many as 71 people so far. Officers say the criminals would call up their victims, pretending to be a friend or family member in desperate need of money. Police seized 46 mobile phones and large amounts of ATM cards in the operation. They also confiscated a number of passbooks and about $10,000 in cash. According to officers, the ring was first discovered in 2014, led by a 35-year-old man with a criminal record and his 37-year-old wife. The couple recruited a number of core members, who then went on to look for what police called puppets, people with local bank accounts and ATM cards. The puppets were offered anywhere between $800 to $2,000 to buy their accounts for criminal use. The couple would then randomly call up victims and pretend to be a family or friend in desperate need of money. If victims took the bait, they'd be asked to transfer money into the puppet accounts. Police say the ring managed to scam 88 victims, involving around $2 million. Officers also noted that the puppets tended to be grassroots citizens, such as students, drivers or cleaners, in need of money and were usually approached by core members in bars, parks or through friends. According to police, they were aware of what the bank accounts would be used for and therefore had also committed a crime. So far, 71 people involved in the ring have been arrested. Among them are 58 men and 13 women, aged between 15 and 59 years. The ring tended to use local bank accounts and phone numbers. Chile's president has visited an area that was evacuated after a volcano erupted. And the White House has contradicted an apology made by U.S. President Barack Obama by saying he didn't sign up on the drone strike in Pakistan that killed two captives. Arthur Urquilla reports. The White House says U.S. President Barack Obama did not authorize drone strikes in Pakistan that accidentally killed two hostages. 
The President did not specifically sign off on these uh, two operations. There are policies and protocols in place for our counterterrorism professionals to make decisions about carrying out these kinds of operations based on uh, a wide variety of things, including uh, a, an assessment of near certainty that the target is an al-Qaeda target uh, and that civilians would not be harmed if the operation were carried out. This goes against earlier comments by Obama, who took full responsibility for the CIA strikes in January. American Warren Weinstein, who had been held hostage since 2011, and Italian aid worker Giovanni Loporto were killed in the strikes on an al-Qaeda compound. <laughs> Chilean President Michelle Bachelet has visited residents who fled their homes because of a volcanic eruption on Wednesday. It was the first major eruption of the volcano since 1961, and it forced some 4,000 people to flee. No sabemos cómo va, cómo va, um, Bacalay said with the unpredictable nature of the volcano, authorities are keeping an eye on any future eruptions. Acres of farmland have been blanketed in ash, and in some areas, the sheer weight of ash collapsed the roofs of houses. Winds carried part of the massive ash cloud over parts of neighboring Argentina. Amateur footage captured the moment a stage collapsed at an Indiana high school, injuring more than a dozen people. One person was critically injured. Um, I just saw just this shock, this look of shock, and this moment of silence after it had collapsed, a moment of confusion, and then began screaming from parents and faculty and staff in a rush to the stage. As soon as it fell, I, uh, I just didn't know what happened, and then I saw that people's feet were stuck under a lot of wood, and I lifted a lot of wood off of a lot of people. Um, the way that I got out was there was a girl who hurt her foot, and I, I carried her out. Students were on stage for the finale of a music performance when it collapsed into the orchestra pit below. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. Kowloon will be a bit noisier than usual this weekend, as it plays host to some of the world's top experimental musicians. Kill the Silence is the name of the event, and it promises to be a show like no other. Ben O'Rock reports. <laughs> If you're looking for something different to do this weekend, then you won't be able to get much more different than this. Japanese turntablist Takuro Mizuta Lippet, better known as DJ Sniff, is one of the many acts appearing at the Kill the Silence Festival, which is in its third year. Taku builds layers of noise through scratching, sampling and synthesized sound waves, creating a unique audio experience. Yeah, it's really about kind of building a narrative, I think. Um, trying to build an arc or trying to engage the audience. Um, and yeah, trying to just find a kind of a, an arc or narrative that I could build with you know, all this other people's material. Joining Taku will be local musician Steve Hoy, who goes under the name Nerve, and Kang Chi Xing. Both classically trained, the pair blend technology and traditional instruments to produce eclectic and edgy themes. They say their classical background helps them break the conventional rules of music. At the beginning, we study the rules, and then, okay, when we know more about this rule, we want to break it, and we, we want to do other things. But actually, it became a dialogue with what we have learned. I think technology really changed how people live their life, mm. and also really affect the value system a lot, because like, everything can be mass produced so easily. But I think, for me, good art is good art. It's um, no technology can replace that. Also appearing at the event are Japanese noise gods Hijokadan, Hatsune Kadan, and a host of other acts that will satisfy those who are perhaps fed up with mainstream pop. The event is on Saturday night and Sunday night at the HKICC Li Shao Ki School of Creativity in Kowloon City.